So I'm so excited to start a new series today. It's a series on tithing. It's don't stop tithing. Amen. I mean, I'm just joking. I can see all the, the struggles to laugh, but thank you for those who did. We're not talking about tithing today. Uh, that's another blessing that we'll talk about on another day. We're talking about joining the mission. Really want to just make a call over the next month. That's not a new call, is it? But it's often a forgotten call, a neglected call, an ignored call. A call that maybe stirs up a little bit of fear in our own hearts as to whether we have the capacity, the ability to fulfill the mission, which is called the Great Commission. What you should know that brings us some peace is that the mission is called a commission is because we don't go it alone. The promise at the end of the sending out is that Jesus says, surely I will be with you when? Always. So we don't go it alone. When we get stuck on a focus of self, we become very aware of self's inabilities and inadequacies, and it freezes the purposes of God in our lives. Amen. I want to just refresh and revisit the gospel, our gospel. I don't know if you know that it's possible, but it's possible to have more than one gospel. There's the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, which we'll look at today. But then if you look deeper into the life of a believer and the believers, you'll find that there's many dark gospels, different expressions of what faith is and what it is to serve God. I'll tell you a little bit of my experience in coming to faith is that I had some experience in church life. In fact, a lot of experience in church life. My mother got saved when I was about seven or eight, which meant I got saved. You know how that works. You inherit the promises through your parents. I'm only playing. But I I had church life experience. I was baptized in the Holy Spirit at a church camp when I was also around that age. I'm not sure the age. But I was very grateful for that because I lived convicted. So even though I tried to have a lot of fun, could have been better if I didn't know God. Um, But I knew him, so I always knew that my days were numbered. But there was a misconception or a misunderstanding in my doctrinal theology that kept me away from God. And that misunderstanding was get right to be right in God. So even though I felt the calling of God back to church and back to faith, I had this pressure of a pre-work that needed to happen. Sort those things in your life out before you come into faith and surrender your life to Jesus. Now it's backwards. So that process took me about 18 months. And thank you, God, by the mercy of God, I did come in. But what anything can happen in 18 months, how many of you know that? My gospel was wrong. And it separated me from God. It didn't reconcile me to God. It was a gospel that sounded a bit like this. Let me find my notes on my device. Uh, Let's pray. That's always a good idea, isn't it? I didn't pray in the last service, and it did well. So we're going to pray. It went well, so hopefully it goes better. Father, we just thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the gospel. We choose the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. No other gospel. I pray, God, that you would magnify, highlight, expose every error in our thinking that shuts us down and does not bring us into life. Thank you for the freedom of your story. Your story becomes our story as we open our hearts to examine our lives, to understand where we're at, but to know where we're going. And so I commit this word to you. I pray for an anointing God, not an anointing to preach well, but an anointing to convey the heart of God, to speak the words of God that we would know the, the, the very will of God for this church in this season, for our lives today. And so God, I, I pray that every preconceived, pre-planned hindrance or obstacle is removed in Jesus' name. I surrender. We surrender. Have your way, God. I pray that we would be found on the platform of the good news. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I want to just maybe describe to you my gospel. It wasn't a freeing gospel. It wasn't a liberating gospel. It was somewhat a, a, a gospel that bound me, slowed me up and slowed me down. The results of my gospel were this. And even after I came into to faith, the wrong gospel, my gospel, was a gospel that was a burden. And so it wasn't one that I shared. It was a gospel that I was failing at. (laughs) So it wasn't one that I was confident in. In fact, it brought a degree of anxiety when it came to my faith. A lack of confidence. It was a gospel that I saw that had to be earned. 
one that I had to work for every day. It was ultimately a gospel that disqualified me in the place that I was at. And in my disqualification, I became isolated. I hid away that no one would ever find out that I couldn't match up to my gospel. It's often the gospel that we find. It's not the gospel we believe in. It's not the gospel that we read about. It's often the gospel that we live. Always trying to catch up. Trying to be enough. To be adequate. Match up to what God expects. Never realizing that he expects nothing. In fact, he insists on nothing. <laughs> See, there's a life that flows from the gospel if it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It releases you, it does not hindrance you. It calls for a response, but it's a willing response. And in fact, it releases the right response when the gospel is understood correctly. When we look at some of the struggles in, in the New Testament churches and we'll look at some of the examples given, or one of the examples given, we realize that the wrong gospel has massive implications on your life experience. We can come to the same church and hear the same teaching, but have a slightly different gospel and live a completely different experience in God. Jesus came to set you free, not in some ways, but in every way. That freedom should be so tangibly desirable that it's something we want to share. There's a scripture in Proverbs 11.10. I love to quote it at prayer meeting because we generally pray about the city and the nation. And it says, when the righteous prosper, the city rejoices. When the wicked perish, there are shouts with joy. I want to just say this quickly. I'm going to take away from that scripture that when the righteous are prospering, at the same time, the wicked are perishing. I also want to say this. When the church or the righteous are truly prospering, souls are coming in to the kingdom. If there is an evidence of prosperity in my life, I really think that one of the fruits of it would be the I'm winning souls, telling souls about the good news of Jesus Christ. The problem with us and sometimes I experience not what we believe God has said for us or wants for us, but how we apply it is that our news is not good news. Our story of faith has not been a happy story of faith. And so how could I, with with a good conscience, bring somebody in else, uh, somebody else into my unhappy experience. Why would I do that? I'll tell you what that is. It looks like a picture of a soul or a, a believer not prospering. That I've come into faith, but in my faith, I've not known what it is to prosper. And I might have one area of my life that works, but often, if it's one area, it's at the expense of other areas. So sorrow still follows my success which results back to me not sharing my faith. There's this core in me studying the gospel. And before I go into that, I want you to consider, if I can explain this thought, is that the gospel, the expectation, the understanding of Jesus when he shared his teachings and when he gave the commission was that the gospel would be central to every believer's life. This may be unreasonable expectation that if the gospel was central, then Jesus himself would be preeminent in every single life, considered first before every decision. I don't know if it sounds realistic to you. I'm not sure if it's realistic, but I think when you read the scripture and try and understand its request of a life, it thinks that in my future every day, Jesus is going to be number one. And I think that's how we call to live. And I think that's where your prosperity lies and it's where my prosperity lies. Now my suffering lies, my hardship lies, my unhappy faith lies when he's not number one, when he's not my only focus, my primary focus. That's when things go wrong, wrong and I start to struggle in my faith. Now I can only deduce at the slow growth of the kingdom a people with such a good message, with such good news, I can only deduce is the reason for slow growth, if any growth, is that he's not our primary focus. The gospel is not central. It's part of who we've become. And it's not a judgment at all. 
It's a rescue mission. I've spoken about the, the gospel revisited. The Bible shows us in the dealings of, of Paul, certainly with the churches, is that the gospel is something that needs to be revisited in our lives continually. Am I still living by its values or has it become one of my values? You see, if I understand the gospel, which in essence is this, can I, can I give you a breakdown of what I believe the gospel is? If I can find it on my device. This is why I just feel like I might be too old for this iPad. Turn around. I know, but I don't know where everything is. It's just... The essence of the gospel is this, is this, that Jesus, being innocent, was my substitute for my guilty life. That someone had to pay the price and suffer the punishment for my sin, and it wasn't me, although that's what was due to me. It was him, although that wasn't due to him. The message is that he lived the life I could never have lived. But he died as though he lived a life he never would have lived. You see, when we live with an awareness of those great thoughts, it completely alters the attitude of a believer. But we if we live neglecting the value, the generosity, and the price of the gospel, we'll go off and carry many values, Jesus only being one. I want to read you two Beatitudes. Beatitudes are, I think, a communication of a right attitude. I think it's an attitude in response of the gospel, what Jesus has done. It's also a sermon that suggests that when Jesus is central when he's preeminent, this is what transpires in you. Be aware that the converse is also true, is that if he's not central, then these attitudes are very, diff it's very difficult to maintain them. Amen. This is not a sermon to make you feel heavy. Amen. So, so like, smile. So Matthew 5, 3 to 4 says this, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. I want to just say one of the values, one of the goals, dreams, desires in this church is that you grow. If you look at our new family this morning, the heart of God for their lives, our heart for their lives is that they would never continue to be the same as they are today that their lives would move from glory to glory as God deals with in and uh, throughout their lives. The problem is when we desire growth, change and transformation, sometimes we feel that it's in what we do. In fact, I would say often we would have received the thinking that it's in what we do not what we're becoming, while we gaze upon his glory. So the Beatitudes speak about something. They speak about if you put him central in, 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 in a place of preeminence in your life, you're going to experience some change. The change will look like this. And he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs will be the kingdom of heaven. What is it to be poor in spirit? It's not to have nothing or to be poor but it's in the knowledge of who he is and what he's done for me, I choose to position myself in absolute humility. What does humility looks like, look like? It means this, that anything that is valuable in me comes from him. There is nothing that I can do that can make me better in his sight. You see, the trap and the warning Paul gives us in, the, in his, his chastising of the church and their swaying in wrong doctrines is... 
how humanity is predisposed to adding value, finding comfort and acceptance. So what we should find in God when he is central in our lives, because he's not central, we try and find in others. But Paul, uh, Jesus is communicating when he's central, this is who you become. You become humble in my sight. You become humble in the knowledge of who I am. You do not try and add value to what I have done or who I see you to be. Does that make sense? I just want to lay a foundation so that it makes sense when we work through the rest. The second one is he says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now just quickly on the morning. The morning is, I'm aware of who I was. I'm aware of what I did, the life that I lived. It was sinful. I'm aware of that. I'm even aware of, in light of my sin, that a perfect lamb without spot and blemish, Jesus, who lived a perfect life, paid the price for that life. I'm aware of it. It breaks my heart, yet somehow also releases joy in my life. There's sorrow, but there's gratitude. Thank you, Jesus. You know what he says? He says, a a mind that thinks like that, a life that carries that attitude, will know comfort. Now, let me just speak about comfort. The reason why there's a promise of comfort, because comfort is a human need. If it's a human need, then it is one of your needs. Everybody needs to feel comforted. I don't always feel, in fact, I hardly ever feel that I'm cutting, making the cut or making the grade. I don't. It helps to feel comfort. What I've realized is to read a scripture and to know that God wants to comfort me doesn't mean I'm comforted. So I want you to catch the desire, God's heart for you, is that he wants you to feel comfort, not to know comfort. He wants you to be aware of your sin so that when you sin, you can accept Even though I am who I am, he loves me. He accepts me. He adores me. He favors me. You know, what a religious mindset is, or a gospel that believes it needs to earn acceptance, would be now I'm out of favor because of what I've done. Now, I want you to realize, or just see the difference, that with that thinking, there's no comfort. But as soon as I realize that despite me, he loves me. The relief. I don't have to work for it. I don't have to try and be something that I will never be. Never ever be perfect. I will never make the grade. If I could make the grade, then I have no use for Jesus. But I cannot make the grade, so I embrace the gospel and all that it's done in my life. And I feel relieved. I feel comforted. Thank you, Jesus, that despite the mess that I can be, you love me. You accept me. This is the gospel. It's a surrendering to what he's done. It's not a trying to be what he wants me to be. Now, what I love about the Beatitudes is it ends with this command. It's, it's the series of, of, of encouragements to be needy on Jesus. And then it finishes with this different tone and says, now be perfect. Because your Father in heaven is perfect. Really? Now we know that perfect means completion. It means development. It means transformation. It means you change. What Jesus is saying, it's not in what you do. It's in the attitude of your heart. It's in your response to the gospel that changes you. It's not in the acts of your life. Church, it's a massive difference to how we can live. Massive. The implications of your life experience are drastically different. If I think that my success in God is hovers around what I can do, even what I'm good at. A great disappointment when I find out at the end of my life that I've been writing a gift or writing a talent or writing a breakthrough or whatever it is and realize that was never it. It's not what my life was to be centered around. So John and and 3 John 2 says this, and we've prayed it, but we've we've spoken about it. Is everybody Okay. We've spoken about it this year, but, but in looking at the gospel, I had to go back there and realize, John prays, beloved, I pray that you may be in health and prosper in all things, even as your soul prospers. So he uncovers the, the, the desire of God for your life. Not only that you're spiritually making it, that actually your encounter with God has brought health over every area of your life. Now what I've realized is that that is impossible unless I've received the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
and I'm living it. Because if there's anything in me that thinks I need to do something for God, to earn more of God, acceptance, favor, and open door, it's the wrong gospel, and it doesn't offer peace, and it doesn't offer prosperity. Amen. You see, now, my experience and my observation, and particularly of late, is that we live in a world of intense striving. There is a desperate, a more desperate need for security, a more desperate need for value, self-worth than there ever has been. I think maybe because of the, the world of media that we live in, social media, putting our best foot forward, just puts pressure on the rest of the world to find their best foot. Some of us realize we don't, we got ugly feet. There's nothing good about my life. Uh, anyway, I'm not saying that for me, but sometimes, you know, social media can create an impression that somebody else's reality is better than mine. But the gospel teaches that nobody has a good reality outside of Jesus. I don't know if you know, if you've had this experience, but certainly in my context nowadays, and I'm only 39 years old, so I'm still very young and young and impressionable. Um, I mean, I'm going to be 40 in a few months. I really need to say this every week and enjoy just the last few weeks of 30s. I used to say to my wife, which upset her, if I was 36, I would tell her I'm in my 37th year, which is the truth, which for some reason upset her and not me because I was saying I was older than I was, but nowadays I'm 39, and that is it. Um, but every now and again, you meet somebody who's just full of joy. It's not that they're laughing, but the look on their face, their countenance is peace. That's prosperity. It's as if they got something I don't. Or they know something that I don't know, and it must be big. Just the look on his face says a lot. The picture speaks a thousand words. But I don't see that look often. Sometimes I, I get more anxiety in people's faith than security in it. I see more conflict in how I'm serving God. What am I called to do? And then just being at rest, I'm a recipient of the good news. And let me tell you, it is good news. So Paul goes into the church in Galatia and he tackles this precise thinking that he realizes that the gospel has been altered just a bit. But how many of you know, if you're just two degrees off north, when you end up, you're going to be way off track. So he sees the danger of error in the church, and he goes back to the church in Jerusalem, pre-Galatia, and uh, he fights to uphold the truth of the gospel. I just want you to know that today we're revisiting our gospels. What's your gospel? Is it centered around Jesus Christ or does it center about, around what you do for Jesus Christ? Massive difference. Massive. One is an unhappy church, most of which will eventually backslide because you can't live up to that standard. And one is a prosperous church, a church so proud of their gospel that they're quick to share it. So let's read. Are you ready? Yeah, I was hoping for a bit more than that. Tried a, I tried an engaging tone through that introduction. But anyway, I won't use it again. The dangers of forgetting. If you forget the wealth of the gospel, if you're not aware of it all the time, if it's not something that consumes your heart and your mind, you know that when Paul speaks about salvation, he says, if you believe in your heart. So if what you believe has sunk into the depths of your heart, then you'll be saved. You'll be unmoved in your faith. But if what you believe is only in your mind, something else is going to come along that's going to impress you more than the gospel, and it's going to sway you. Now, now Paul gives us this example first of what happened in the early church. I'm not sure of the exact details. And then what repeats itself in the church in Galatians. And he uses the example of Peter's life, that even Peter went off course because he hadn't fully embraced the wealth, the value, the acceptance that he should have found in the gospel, the finished work of Jesus Christ. I just want to say, if Peter went off track a little bit, then so can I, and so can you. Amen. Amen. 
So he gets to the crux of the matter. This is what was happening. He got word that the circumcision group, were, who were known as Judaizers, are Judaizers, they had found or reached the church in Galatia and started to, to fellowship there. And Peter was with the Galatian church. And um, they started to mix faith in Jesus with observing the law. So everybody agreed that Jesus was the Messiah, but in serving him and finding salvation, we needed to make sure that we observed the practices of the law. And if we didn't do that, we were less than those who did. Now, so convincing were they that Peter joined in, and even so did Barnabas. And Paul got wind of this, and he went to... Um, he went, I'm getting my stories mixed up. Actually, Peter wasn't in Galatia, but Peter had, did fall for, for, uh, tr- into this trap. And when he heard that, Paul heard that Peter fell into this trap, he went to Jerusalem and he, he gave his case and he said, listen, I've heard of a gospel that's not my gospel. It's not the gospel I preach to the Gentiles. And when he presented his gospel, the, the, the apostle said, yes, you're right. Go and continue to minister to the Gentiles. And then the story repeats itself in Galatia. Now, I want you to know, I want to say that it repeats itself because I think it is a practice that repeats itself, church. You know, when I got saved, everything went right for me. I felt good. I mean, I don't know if everything went right outside. I'm not sure what it looked like. But inside, I was really feeling good. It was, it was easy. It was a new life. Stay with me. But somewhere along the line, as I mixed with community, I started to receive a pressure, and I'm saying receive, take on a pressure that led me to try and keep up with community, to be like, to pray like, to sound like, to worship like, and to, to be all of these things. You know, what that did was it quenched the life out of me. What I had been, you know, my whole life, I had been really trying to be like, you know, my mother's sitting there writing notes. I don't know what she's writing because it can't be from me. Must be writing a letter to somebody. But she sent me to a private school, which I'm very grateful for. I don't know if I would have lasted or made it or I think my life would have ended up if I didn't go to Thomas More. And not that Thomas More was good, but there was, some, I mean, it was good, but there were some uh, uniquenesses about the church, that school that really helped me in my troubled years. But I was also exposed to great wealth and things that I just never had seen in my, in my life. So I found myself always feeling like I'm a little bit out of the center. I don't have what they have and always desiring to be like them somehow. So in our room, I used to lie in bed. I'm wasting my time, but you'll appreciate my stories, I hope. Um, I, I mean, I was 14, so cut me a little bit of slack and extend a little bit of grace. But I used to just think, you know, so-and-so is, you know, he's got those Reebok tackies. Before I came to this school, I never knew what Reebok was. I thought it was a, a bock or a buck um, <laughs> at the game reserve that I've never been to. But, but then I got to Thomas More and everyone wore Nikes and Reeboks. And in those days, you couldn't walk into Total Sports and buy them, hey? So... Uh, it was, it was something to aspire to. And so I used to lie in bed and think, God, if I could own, I didn't think God. Simon, if there's a way we can get those shoes, life is going to be, we're going to make it. Everything is going to work out for us. And I genuinely did that. And I, I carried that catch-up mentality all the way through school, out of school. Then I started playing club sports, always just wanting to be like the rest of the guys have a little bit nicer car, have a little bit more money, have a cell phone. I remember Basil offered me a job. Basil was my father-in-law. He wasn't then. Um, I think he was trying to get me into his family. He obviously saw something. I'm only playing. I'm only playing. He offered me a job. And, uh, and it, you know, in my little life at that stage, it, it offered everything that I wanted. I think it was a little sal- a salary, sorry. Uh, a cell phone and maybe a petrol allowance. In my world... That was massive because I had arrived. I was like one of the guys. I would have been like one of the guys. And I turned the job down because I knew that Bible college is in my heart and I wouldn't mind messing somebody around out there, but not somebody in the church. So I thought I better not mess them around. I thought if I took the job, I'm going to quit in six months and come to Bible college. So I just came to Bible college and the rest is history. My point is I always felt like I needed a little bit extra. I brought that into my faith. I approached faith like that, 
and I developed it in my faith. But never catching up, always needing more, always learning more. When I came onto the ministry team, the first year was my dream. First year of my dream was the worst year of my life because I was completely, I felt completely out of my depth, not realizing that God had called me to be me in this place at that time. And so somehow whatever I needed was in me. So I spent my lives, my worst thing was prayer meeting. Now my best thing, just so you know. Um, my worst thing was prayer meeting. And, and if I knew that I was rusted to do prayer meeting, I would spend like 10 days reading prayer books. And knowing that the more I did, the worse I got. Sure, those were hard years. But that's sometimes how our faith has become. Become hard. Become tough. And it might not even we don't associate with our faith, but if our faith was good, we would share it. If my news was good news, I would be telling people about it. But if it somehow turned out to be not so good for me, but I'm sure it's good for others, so I stay here, but don't share it, something's wrong with my gospel. So when Paul bringing correction to the church in Galatia, he says this in Galatians 2 verse 4 to 15. Who are you, oh, sorry, we who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Is that it? No. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one can be justified. Say no one can be justified. So what Paul is addressing here is that something had happened that even though they had been preached the pure gospel and they started off like me, excited and alive and grateful and energized, vibrant in their faith, something that had happened where they started to work for their faith. They had to earn the approval of God and it became tiresome. You know, in this chapter, what he really conveys, what he presents is there's two orders of faith. There's the old system and there's the new system. The old system is like this. When I say order, it's not a great order. It's just three points that are on a different order. The old order is this. Put your faith in Jesus Christ, one. Two, obey the law of God as best you can. And three, receive eternal life. The new order is this. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. At that moment, you are saved, accepted, loved and favored and if you didn't do another thing the love doesn't stop and in light of the generosity that I receive from God through simple faith in Jesus I'm compelled to obey and to live out the ways of God something happened in this church where they started, they went from faith in God, acceptance, love, and favor, to faith in God, and then keeping up with God. The implications to the outcome of your life, very, very, very different. And I want to just work through some of those in a moment. Is everybody okay? But first of all, justified means this, to be made right with God. So often we get ourselves into a thinking that if I do, I'm right with him. He's good. But if I don't do, if I make a mistake, and God forbid, if I sin as I will, I'm out of favor. And so I have to catch up, read more, pray more, do more. And maybe I'll get back into that place that I love, which is his presence or just feeling like he loves me. You know that that's a lie, but it's often where we live. I know that in those two orders, we all agree that the second order is right, don't we? Do we all agree that the second order is right? The second order is this, faith in Jesus, at that moment, fully accepted, fully loved, fully favored. We all agree that that's right. We don't work for those things. We get them through faith in Jesus. However, I really believe that often our life experience is that we live the second. I mean, we live the first. We live trying to win the approval of God, trying to maintain a standard of righteousness that we never, ever, ever could have found in our own strength. When Paul goes into this church, he says, what has happened here? After receiving a pure gospel, you've gone back to an old system where you think you can earn the right 
uh, or earn the rights to favor and love. Now, you might think, Simon, who cares? I'm at church, I pray, I read sometimes, and it's because I'm busy and whatever the case is. That, I mean, I don't even care about those things, to be honest. That's between you and God, nothing to do with me. I want you to know that you're saved, loved, accepted, fully favored right now. It doesn't matter what you're doing. If you have put your faith in Jesus. I think, even though we agree with the first order, faith in him, acceptance from God, we're scared to give people that freedom. We're scared to tell people that if, let them know that if uh, you don't have to do anything to prove your commitment to God, he loves you anyway. We're scared to give people that freedom that you don't earn favor. You don't earn love. You don't earn acceptance. You're fully accepted. We're scared to let people off the hook in case they sin again. So we'd rather preach a gospel of obedience than a gospel of freedom. We're so scared that they won't do enough, that they won't be involved, that they won't give their lives to the house, that they won't serve enough, that they won't open up their destiny because of the sacrifice. We're so scared that they won't perform to the point where we want, where we want them to get to. We're so scared of that, that we restrict them, we enslave them. See, this is how you do it. You need to be here on Tuesday, you need to be here on Friday, you need to be on Wednesday, you need to be Sunday, two service, whatever the case is. And it's not that we don't even say that. But there's the impression of, I need to do, come. I want to tell you right now, that impression is wrong. And I will back it up, not back it up, I will follow it up by saying that, this. If we put that on people, they're going to shrivel up and die because they can never live up to that standard. If you can maintain frustration in your faith forever, you're amazing. But it's not how God called you to live. So you'll either live frustrated or you'll move on and live a more, at least a more enjoyable life in sin. It's not, it's not how God called us to live. It's a very different gospel church. He called you to be free in your faith, to be set free in your faith. You don't earn his love through prayer. You don't earn his love or his acceptance through reading the Bible. You don't do those things to get love. You are loved. You are accepted. Do you know what the first order produces in my life? Faith in Jesus, earning favor, then I'm saved or accepted or loved. It'll make you anxious in your faith. What does anxiety, uh, anxious faith mean? Am I enough? Doing enough? Am I coming enough? Am I, I'm not quite there, so let me read 15 prayer books before I lead prayer. Let me, I didn't read this week, so let me read six settings or devotions today, and hopefully God, I'll catch up, everything will be okay. You will be anxious about who you are in God. Not free, anxious. You'll be empty if you're catching up in your faith. You'll not live in a fullness of heart, fullness of life, prosperity. You'll be spiritually exhausted eventually. You know, there's an anger. We've allowed people to swallow a lie that it's in what you do that gets you through. Lost my place. Anger. So this is what I was saying. The first order, earning love, acceptance, and favor you'll start saying things like, I need a break from church. I need a break from community. This is getting a bit too much, you know. I need to back off and find myself again. It's too much. It's too busy. It's not fulfilling. I just need to worship on my own. Now, I'm not making light of those things, but those are signs of exhaustion which come out of wrong thinking, wrong doctrine, bad theology. That's a sign that there's a burden on you that's too heavy for you to carry. And it's a burden that you were never, ever expected to carry, at least not in God's economy, but only in the economy of the law. The law is this, it's human effort. In the Jewish community, it means a whole lot of observances. In our lives, it means that somehow I can earn what God has already done for me. 
And somehow we fall into the trap and the church repeats the cycle generation to generation of trying to live in a catch-up mentality with God, trying to be enough. You know how we know that we're an exhausted church? Not we, but I'm happy to say we're exhausted if we're exhausted. So we're not sharing our faith. Our news is not good news, church. I miss something. I miss the ease. I miss the grace. I miss the joy. I miss the laugh. I want you to tell you about my new car. I got this new car, this Golf GTI. Hmm. I went into the bank, they just gave it to me. I had to sign something, but they gave it to me. I was so grateful to God. This car, I didn't get a car. But from gratitude, after paying probably six months of heavy installments for my new car, you know that what goes? Gratitude. I'm not grateful for nothing. This car is costing me a lot of money every month. I need to offload it, except I owe more than it's worth, and so I can't. I'm no longer grateful. But I would love a Golf GTI. I was telling the church earlier this morning that on my way to church, another man, a man of God, flew past me in a Golf GTI. Now, now if that man had given me that car this morning, I would be grateful. Why? Because it would be for free. When I receive something for free, when it costs me nothing, when I didn't have to earn it, wow, what are I going to Curtis, I know you in law, brother, but check, the ministry, check what ministry does. You get golf, I'm only playing. If it's free, I'm grateful. If I'm grateful, I share it. If it doesn't cost me anything, if it excites me, if it satisfies me, if it brings me relief, I'm grateful. If I'm grateful, I share it. But if it's not central, if what Jesus has done for me is not central to my everyday experience, how can I be grateful? If I've got into the place where I feel like I'm earning my spot with God, how can I be grateful? Why would I share a faith that I can't even perform myself? I wouldn't. I would shut down. I'd never bring you into something that I can't even do myself. I'm still trying to sort it out. I know it's me. It's not you. It's your thinking. It's your theology. It's all wrong, and I could use some other words. I'm at church. Somebody who lives in this first order, earning God's love, acceptance, and favor, they're insecure because they don't feel secure in God, always wondering if I've done enough. Somebody who's trying to earn love, faith, and accept, love, acceptance, and favor in God, is always critical because they're not living up to a standard. And so they will point out the areas of your life where you're also not meeting the standard. If I'm failing, let me tell you what's going to happen. You're going to fail too. And if you don't know it, I'm going to tell you because I'm not going to suffer this gospel alone. (laughs) We become judgmental when we're trying to earn favor with God. We live in emptiness instead of fullness of heart. Now in the second, if we believe, if our belief in God has penetrated the depths of my heart, if I know I'm fully accepted, loved and favored, and so everything I do, I do it in response to what he's done for me. I just want you to think about this slowly. I know I'm jumping all over the place, but I don't mind. You're gonna have to just put up with me and get the podcast of the first service a little bit better. But but I want you just to imagine this, the two different outcomes. Is one is striving to stay abreast with God. The other is resting in what he's received from God and so able to minister what he's received. The one is a slave to a standard of righteousness he will never ever meet. The other becomes Christ-like in only expressing what he's already received. You see, we have to know, church, your future. Transformation is born out of responding to the gospel. 
what Jesus Christ has done for me. Amen. Amen. I don't know if you've heard this, this, um, this term, the scandalous gospel. I haven't really, I haven't researched it. I've just heard people reference it and I haven't really wanted to get involved. But I would imagine the scandal of the gospel is useless sinners are getting in and they're doing nothing to do it to get in. That's the scandal of the gospel. Sinners, undeserving heathens are getting saved. Can you, can you believe it? Kick them out. Close those doors. How dare they? But that's what it's here for. But as soon as we start to put a standard on the world, we've lost already. We'll be the shrinking church, not the growing church. Some of you might think, but what about sin? Sin's not an issue. God doesn't accept sin. It says this in, in uh, Titus 2, 11 and 12. God doesn't want sin for your life because it hurts you, separates you from him. But it says this, and I want you to test your theology again. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age. What is it saying? It says grace. Now that you're under grace, live right. But, but you and I would interpret this differently depending on what my theology is, what my understanding of grace is. Grace doesn't insist I live right. It comforts me to right living. If I'm convinced by God's grace, he died for me, I didn't deserve it. He took on all my sin, I didn't deserve it. He showed me kindness, I didn't deserve it. He was generous towards me. I didn't deserve it. I did nothing to get it. That's what grace has done in me. See, grace is not a school teacher. Unless I'm under the order of legalism, then I'm going to think grace insists on our, that I obey. That grace doesn't do that. Grace is kind. Grace is loving. Grace is favor. And so it's the kindness of God that leads me to obedience and out of sin into holiness. It's the kindness of God that leaves me standing. Somehow I did nothing except respond to his goodness and I am a changed person. Living right, I am holy. How did this happen? Just responded to an age-old story called the gospel. Amen. Man, I'm going to finish now. You can say praise Jesus. So I just want you to give, I want to give you Paul's thoughts, the conclusion to his gospel. He says this, Galatians 19, 2.19. For through the law I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for me. So in light of his understanding of this, he says things like this, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is I, I no longer live, but Christ that lives within me. What is he saying? Can I explain it like this? Every human has pretty much the same needs. We all need to be accepted, feel accepted, feel valued, and feel approved of, or, or uh, uh, receiving a, a sense of self-worth. Everybody needs that. Some of us find it in different ways. Some of us will find self-worth in our careers. Some of us will find it in the fact that we have some money, so I feel secure, I feel valuable because I have some monetary value. Some of us will find it in our families because I'm married and I have a family and it all seems to be working well and I'm really grateful for that. Nothing wrong with being grateful for it. So I find some worth, some value, some accomplishment or achievement in these areas, some of us find it in a relationship, and even if our relationships are bad, what happens is if I find value in a relationship, when one ends, I find another because it meets a need in me, even though it's not permanently met. Amen. 
The thing about those things is you might lose your job. You might lose your money. And people lose their families. People lose their relationships. They fall out of relationship. These things happen. There's nothing that is as permanent, as securing, as fulfilling, as satisfying as the love of God. So Paul understood that. So he said, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Because I realize that everything I need is found in Jesus. And I learned that in the gospel. I have a wife, an amazing wife. Don't know how she does it. Honestly, don't know. But I pretend she's not in case she wants me to do more. So I give her encouragements, but not too many in case she gets greedy. But all of that to say she is amazing. I have an amazing one. I have four amazing children. I was lying in the one part that's not so amazing is every, every night I have to put my son Benjamin, who's two, asleep. It takes like half an hour. It's really, I don't feel like I have that half an hour, but I have to do it. So I'm lying next to him. Sometimes I just have to breathe and look at him, and I think, oh, God. Such a blessing. Four beautiful children, such a blessing. They're in my life, but they're not my life. Jesus is my life. Now, I have to train myself to think like that because I can easily get lost in my family. I can easily see the blessing of God as my security. It's not my security. It's just the blessing of God. He is my security. He accepts me. He, is, he loves me. He favors me. It comes from him. But when I take him off the middle, if I remove him from the throne and I ask him to share the throne in my life with family and business and other priorities, my gospel goes wrong. And I start to have to work very hard to maintain my peace. Very, very hard. I've said this, I said it earlier. I heard a man preach that if we work very hard to get promoted or get a promotion in God or in the workplace, we'll have to work very hard to stay in that place of promotion. But when God blesses us, when he promotes us, did nothing to get there and we do nothing to stay there. Just remain faithful to him. Church, won't you stand? I want you to really identify in your life this morning, in your mind and your thoughts and your faith experience. God, what has looked like, what looks like slavery? What looks like bondage? Why am I working so hard? What areas am I working so hard in to capture a sense of love, acceptance or favor? And I ask you if you can, just everyone stand as still as you can. I think this is a very important moment in our lives. I'm believing for a new season in our church, that as we come to grips with the ease of the gospel, the grace of the gospel, that we'll be quick and grateful to share it. But it needs for us to identify, I've actually lost track here. Life has got too hard. Faith has got too hard. God has got too hard. Church has got too hard. In fact, I don't have much time for the community of God outside of church on Sunday. Something's wrong with that theology. Let's just bow our heads. Father, I pray. I pray earnestly, God, sincerely, that you identify the shackles in our lives, the shackles in our thinking that limit us from engaging in or receiving all that you've given us, all that we've found or should be getting in the gospel. God, I pray that you would deliver us from the things that we've already been delivered from where we've found faith, hard work, where we found community, hard work. Where we found the gospel to be more of a burden than a liberation. God, I pray that you would align our thinking. God, where we have put so many things on a par in priority with you, where we've asked you to share the priority of provision, where we've asked you to share the priority of giving time, We've asked you to share even the priority of 
family and these demands, we repent and we say that you are Lord, Lord of our lives. We enthrone you, Jesus. We approach you with poverty of spirit that we might inherit the kingdom in this day. We acknowledge our weakness and imperfection, but receive the comfort. I thank you, God, that we would be a people that are comforted. We would be a people that are grateful. We would be a people that are energized. We would be a people that are vibrant. We would be a people of the promise. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would come in as we let go of performance, as we let go of hardship, as we let go of the efforts, human effort, earning any sense of right standing with God, I pray that as we release that burden in Jesus' name, that we would come into an ease, a rhythm of grace over the life of this church, which would cause life to come within our personal lives, but life to flow within this house in Jesus' name. God, we pray that every religious thinking, every religious bondage comes off today in Jesus' name. Those thoughts of performance, those thoughts of catching up, those thoughts of having to be enough or working to a standard that is impossible to meet. We break the power of the law in Jesus' name. We thank you, God, that you would come in. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would minister even now, bringing relief to hardship. Dealing with separation from God through performance and law. Father, we even repent and I repent. Having the words of grace, but not a tone of grace and encouraging the church. I pray and declare that in this place, we will never set aside the grace of God but rest in it live in it and receive from it in Jesus name I want to just ask you if you're here for the first time everybody not for the first time everybody's eyes closed please if you're here today and you not sure if you're in faith if you're in relationship with Jesus you're not sure if you're saved you're not sure if you're justified you're not sure if you could say that you have experienced salvation. I suggest to you that you're here for this very moment that God in his goodness has brought you to this place to rescue you. And you might have even come here thinking you don't need rescuing. I want to say that if you don't need rescuing, then Jesus never needed to die. But he did die and he died for you. So I'm going to ask you, if you want to make a decision this morning to put your faith in Jesus, acknowledging him as your Lord, as the God who has saved you, then just raise your hand so I can see where you are. I'm not going to ask you to do anything else except put your hand up so we can pray. Everybody else's eyes are bowed or closed, rather. Is there anybody that would want to make that commitment? We had a handful of people that, Surrender their lives to Jesus in the first morning service. I'm going to ask if you would like to make that decision. The young man at the back, in the doorway. Is there anybody else? Was that a hand on the left? Yeah, if there's anybody, just raise your hand so I can see you. I just want to say, don't come this far and not step into faith. You might not feel like it, but you are right there. And he is right with you. Only calling you to respond. Is there anybody that would like to respond to Jesus, to the gospel of Jesus Christ this morning? Raise your hand. Okay, church, let's pray for those who have made that commitment. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for Jesus. We recognize that you loved us before we were right with you. We recognize that there's nothing we can do to make you love us more, to earn more favor, to earn your acceptance. 
And so as we put our faith in Jesus, we receive your love, we receive acceptance, we receive favor. We recognize we have not lived well. We recognize that we are sinners and we repent. We ask you to forgive us of our sins. We surrender our hearts. We surrender our lives. We ask that you come and be Lord of our lives. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would lead, that you would guard, and that you would comfort us. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Church, before you go anywhere, I just want to say this. This church will be a church that accepts all. We'll never turn away a discarded life or a forgotten life. We want to be upholders of the true gospel of Jesus Christ, not our gospel. And in order for us to thrive in that, we have to embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ. In order for us to minister freedom, we have to find freedom. You know that sometimes freedom doesn't come from ministry. You can leave ministry without the right thinking, understanding of God and never be free. So I want to ask you for the week to meditate on what we've received in God, what he's done for you and why he did it and what the implications are for you. They are peace. They are faith. They are life. They are freedom. Anything that binds or looks like a bondage in your life, it's not of God and you don't need to be under it. Amen. Amen.